from uh, 1960. 66 and 67, uh, uh, working on atomic physics, uh, shock tube, Van der Waals pressure broadening. Uh, then PhD in Alva in 71. Um, uh, then uh, from 74 to 76, uh, project scientist on uh, ANS, astronomical uh, Netherlands satellite. Uh, then in uh, uh, 76, was hired as assistant professor at Stromia Harvard and uh, has been here ever since. He's currently NASA funded for, um, uh, uh, for coded aperture imaging detector and imaging technology development, balloon flights, Excite 1 and Excite 2 and Proto exist one and Proto exist two to develop a broadband X-ray imaging for satellite proposals. So um, he's talking to us uh, uh, today about a high energy astrophysics decadal program for TDA. Uh, let me remind uh, some people that we are recording uh, this talk. So if you don't want to appear in the video, this will be a good time to turn off your camera. And also please feel free uh, this to, to some people to ask your question uh, in the chat and this will be read out loud uh, at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, please talk. Before Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> thanks everybody for coming and those online. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm going to talk about a 10 to 12 year program not that we can be thinking that far ahead, but we'll try try it anyway, to do some really fundamental astrophysics that time domain astronomy astrophysics allows. It, this is something that has been a long-term goal of my group for many years now. So I'm going to walk you through what was in the uh, abstract that, that got sent around <clears throat> three mission concepts. I'll be spending most of the time on the first one, which is what you've been looking at here, <clears throat> a proposal that we plan to submit in 2024. It's not clear exactly what the AO, the Announcement of Opportunity date will be, but it's um, likely to have in, uh, come out in draft form in January of 24, and then would be released you know, 30 to 90 days after that, whatever, April or May. Um, so that's this is what we're what we're now working on actively. Um, so I'm going to begin with the science, uh, and I'm staring at some of it here on this slide. But um, there are the science drives the kind of mission that we want to propose for this first mission, and if it all works and if we get approved, obviously, uh, it can expand in a very <laughs> relatively simple way, building more small satellites and telescopes to put up a constellation, which is now increasingly common, but not yet in astrophysics, astronomy astrophysics. But, and let me just make the comment here, uh, because uh, those who read AAS uh, newsletters and the like are probably aware that constellations of satellites, like communication satellites and whatnot, are not very good for astronomy or LSST. Uh, the constellation that we're talking about here that would allow full sky imaging full time with 12 small sats would be absolutely no impact on optical or infrared astronomy. These are roughly cubic meter, uh, not gigantic uh, Starlink uh, satellites. They would be painted black and whatnot. There's no reflective parts. So so this is not a constellation to be uh, concerned about, but rather something that allows us to do something we've never done before. Imaging 24 seven, all the time, all the sky. And I'm um, gonna you know, get to why that is a critical need for some of the most fundamental questions. And let me start with one that I, it's really in many ways driving the mission design. And that is to be able to do something that was um, realized could be done, at least uh, looked plausible, 25 years ago. And that is detecting the very first stars, population three stars, uh, which are certainly massive stars. There are many, many papers. I'm not going to go through or even cite them. Uh, but they're, they're massive stars, the very first stars 
they will produce gamma ray bursts, long gamma ray bursts. Um, and the luminosity, which I am not going to be talking about otherwise, I'll just mention it now, or the total energy, the total uh, some a parameter that is quite common in the GRB world, the total fluence of of the burst as emitted at the source or the isotropic energy released in a long gamma ray burst. For long gamma ray burst is about 10 to the 53 ergs. For a typical long burst duration of 10 to 100 to even 1,000 seconds, you can do the numbers in your head, the luminosities are enormous. These are the most luminous objects, electromagnetic radiation in the universe that we know of. They dwarf AGN, everything else. They only on for tens or hundreds or thousands of seconds. And uh, they are easily, quote unquote, detectable with not a focusing telescope like Chandra or New Star at hard X-ray energies, because those are by definition or by uh, reflective optics, uh, very, very narrow field of view instruments. So they are never going to detect, nobody ever intended or thought they would or should. So you need a wide field telescope, which has been uh, something that our group has been working on for a long while and many other groups as well, um, and is what is the primary uh, burst detector. And I'm gonna talk about other transients as well, but let me stay with burst for the moment, which is Swift Bat the Burst Alert Telescope. So this is what we're going to propose this, and I'm gonna show you a few more images of it in a few slides. It's a wide field, I won't give you the numbers now, of field of view, it's actually got multiple fields of view. A very wide field and a detector plane at the bottom, let me find the mouse here, here we go. Uh, here's the detector plane down here. The base of this, this is the coated mask up here. The detector plane is <clears throat> in round numbers, a thousand square centimeters. It's a little bit less than that. Let's not worry about the details. <clears throat> the mask, you'll see the dimensions is a meter by a meter. That gives you the scale. So this is not a huge, big thing. Um, and what ultimately would be proposed, because I probably won't have the time to mention it later, is showing that a mission that we are going to propose for two such satellites that could be done with a budget that we think we understand relatively well, we've done a lot of work on this, um, <clears throat> that would be possible to be launched as a small explorer of SMEX. Um, <clears throat> with that uh, start, we will propose in something like 2028 or 29, after this mission has been up and demonstrated and if it does everything we predicted it can do and probably a lot more that we can imagine it could do, would enable a uh, follow-up proposal, totally separate proposal for a medium explorer mission, but still within the explorer class that would launch an additional 10 of these. And the field of view of this telescope in round numbers is a steradian, 12 of them cover full sky. They can be inertially pointed at fixed targets, which are just you know, and overlapping at their half max field of view sensitivity. So it's relatively flat sensitivity across the entire celestial sphere. So that's where we're going with all this. And uh, what you're looking at here is a, is a current list of science team members. And uh, anybody here at the CFA, there are several CFA names on here, as you can see. Um, Talk to me, talk to us. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity here. There's a lot of hard work to do in the next year before this proposal gets submitted. So let's go on from this that we've been looking at for probably longer than we need. And why am I not <laughs> advancing this slide? That's kind of weird. Did I, do I have to have the mouse in some particular place? It was <laughs> working before. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. All right. What did, what did you do in case I lose it? Uh, I just clicked with the mouse on the. Okay. All right. Let's. So anyway, um, this is what we're going to launch. I've already mentioned it. Two small sats on opposite sides of the Earth, just to cover as much sky as possible. Let me mention it now, because again, I probably won't have time later. The field of view that we're designing 
and the instrument itself, and I'll say a few words about this later, isn't exactly what you're seeing here. Uh, we're going to have, if my colleagues like Brandon back here and Jason, is Jason here? I don't see Jason. Uh, agree, and Dan Violette, graduate student working with us, um, we'll have a separate set of detectors around the four sides of the mask. I've done a lot of work on this over the last few days, literally. It will work, it will fit, it fits, fits within the, the so-called ride share allowable volume, or for those who've heard about this, the ESPA Grande uh, ride share capability. And what that allows is that we can use a, a separate set of detectors from the imaging detectors, which you're gonna see in a few minutes that will trigger and produce crude positions from the ratios of counts on opposite sides of the detector. Okay, so they'll be looking sideways. The satellite, the small sat, which we've done a lot of work with Blue Canyon Technologies on, is able to slew very rapidly, and we can slew over to a burst and then derive the imaging position, which is 30, 40 arc second positions, far better than what Swift Bat is doing. So that's, <clears throat> That means that we can ultimately, with this full sky view, we can detect everything. You don't miss anything that we've yet called it a gamma ray burst. Um, and let's go on. We've got a lot to cover here. Um, and so this full blown version, which I mentioned in the abstract, so those who looked at that have seen this. Uh, acronym for PIXIO 4 pi X-ray Imaging Observatory, something we've been talking about for years, but now we can see a way to do it. Just as a quick aside again, I thought that the notion of the constellation of 12 telescopes would never fit in an Explorer program. That's not the case. I think we can do this uh, quite reasonably in a, an Explorer, a, a medium Explorer budget. So. The probe class missions, which would be anything bigger than an Explorer, I'm gonna tell you about at the end, uh, a near UV to mid IR telescope that can follow up within a matter of minutes on any such burst and identify, make very accurate redshift measurements, but do deep spectroscopy of even the host galaxy for bursts that will go all the way back to the very first stars. Okay, I think we don't need to keep looking at this. Here's the, the current science team and, and uh, engineers and project manager, uh, Hugh Kenner, who's here at, at Central Engineering. Um, I should mention, and, and you uh, hopefully saw this on the very first slide, that we have a major collaboration with Lincoln Labs, MIT Lincoln Labs, uh, and they've been very helpful in our uh, structural design and uh, overall mission design. So I'm just, so this is Harvard, SAO, Lincoln Labs is the prime primary institutions. Caltech is playing a significant role because the ASIC application specific integrated circuit that we read out our imaging detectors with is the new star ASIC. But by the time, <clears throat> even for the, for the SMEX, uh, it is possible that we will be able to use a, an advanced version of the new star ASIC, which will allow us to put uh, not only through silicon vias, which we've been working on, and those who have been following this work uh, will remember that a paper that uh, Jason Pong in our group was the first author on has demonstrated that we can read these things out with through silicon vias, which makes the assembly of these large area relative to something on New Star with eight CCTs, we have 256 on each small set. So you gotta be able to make these and assemble them and test them uh, easily and rapidly, or you're never gonna do it for the cost that you think you can do it. And so these through silicon vias are a major step forward in being able to really do something like this. <clears throat> I won't be talking about that. There's, uh, there's a paper, we have several papers of ours that describe this in detail. Um, so Caltech is a big part of it. And just because I won't mention this again either, if there is a MEDEX and the, the full-blown full-sky version, 
it will be even better than what we're talking about. Uh, because by then, our colleagues at Caltech who designed the ASIC in the first place, and ASIC design is not an easy task. There, there are very few groups that can really do this. So we, we're sticking with our colleagues at Caltech, um, Fiona Harrison and others, and a very well uh, known uh, engineer really, uh, who is the ASIC designer. Because by then, a, an ASIC with smaller pixels will have been developed. It's under development now. The pixel size will go down by a factor of two, from 600 microns to 300 microns. And all of the angular resolution numbers that you'll see on the slide later on, which in the case of what we're going to propose, is roughly six arc minutes, will become three arc minutes. Uh, everything just gets a factor of two sharper. So that's that's another key part of this whole story. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the first science objective I've already been talking about of long gamma ray bursts as probes back not only to the very first stars, but as uh, the preferred way, particularly gamma ray bursts, but also X-ray binaries containing black holes, and even those with neutron stars, do produce bursts, huge bursts uh, from accretion disk instabilities, which are the way that every one of the low mass X-ray binaries with a black hole accreting, every one of those was discovered only from this huge outburst. None of them have been discovered by any other uh, techniques. Yeah, most of you probably aren't aware of that, but that's that's the simple truth. There are 25, 24 round numbers, low mass X-ray binaries containing black holes. There are only two or three, depending on how you count, high mass X-ray binaries. This is in the Milky Way. There are two more, three more in the Large Magellanic Cloud that are high mass X-ray binaries. Those were discovered, uh, going right back to the first one, Cygnus X1, as just very bright X-ray sources with hard power law spectra, which in the early days of X-ray astronomy was very surprising. And we don't, we don't have time to go into more details and most of you probably know about this. So black hole physics, astrophysics is a key to wanting to do all of this. And the time domain aspect is the giant outbursts that allow you to identify new systems. Uh, and again, this is not gonna appear in a later slide, so I'll just mention it now. Um, the four Pixio constellation, looking at the whole sky all the time, is sensitive enough to measure, discover, and measure um, black hole low mass X ray binary outbursts in nearby galaxies. Okay, so that, that's never been done. You, you, you're never looking at Andromeda all the time or in X rays. Uh, so to do it with, with a focusing telescope, you have to have a wide field system. Actually, the E Rosita uh, hard X ray instrument would be, a, will, is already a new way of doing this, but it surveys uh, with much lower cadence uh, than what this would have when you're on all the time. The cadence is, <laughs> you, you don't miss anything. So that's the real difference in where, in where we're going with all this. <clears throat> um, so anyway, long gamma ray bursts to get back to top three stars to understand black holes, short gamma ray bursts to do uh, es essentially immediate identifications of uh, LIGO Virgo Cagra gravitational wave events from neutron star, neutron star or neutron star black hole mergers. That would come very quickly with positions that are much better than what we had with Fermi, which discovered the 1708-17 short burst that was detected at LIGO, LIGO Virgo. So that's the second major objective. Uh, FRBs, fast radio bursts, most of them do not have hard X-ray counterparts, but some of them do. And those are likely due to them arising on magnetars, highly mag uh, magnetized neutron stars, 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 Gauss. Those will be readily, uh, easily detectable with this kind of mission. And finally, <clears throat> in the black hole, low mass X-ray binaries, which are the dominant 
uh, stellar black hole systems that we know of. You know, two in the galaxy with high mass companions like Cygnus X1. There are more than that, Sig X3, SS433. Uh, those are definitely black holes. They just haven't been dynamically demonstrated, but they are, they are black holes. But in the low mass X ray binaries, as I've said now a couple of times, they're all uh, produced, they're all discovered from these huge outbursts. Uh, then VLF, what you'll see here is, uh, has found in the SWIFT bat data, short duration bursts, a few days, <coughs> 10 days in, in some cases, very faint compared to the gargantuan outbursts that are mm -hmm. due to the accretion disk instability. Those um, we do not understand. It's not an accretion disk instability. There's something else going on in black hole LMXBs, which is very interesting because these are real outbursts. And I, I won't put in the numbers. This, this, this will be in papers that we're writing. And those offer a, a new way to discover them. If you're looking at the whole sky all the time and you see a, ten, a few day outburst with a spectrum that is very hard uh, and you have a very good position for it, you, you can identify these, which is very interesting to do because we don't understand how black hole low mass X-ray binaries are formed in the first place. There is a real mystery there, which would be nice to solve after 25 years of, of knowing that they exist, even longer than that. So anyway, these are all very exciting things that, that bursts or burst-like behavior can can, uh, can do for the first time. In the AGN world and uh, supermassive black holes, uh, of course, there's another whole range of things that can be done. I guess I should just say a few words about this. Uh, <clears throat> bursts from blazars are, again, very interesting for understanding the jets and for understanding or constraining by redshifts of blazars, when were the first supermassive black holes with jet-like emission form. Uh, as probably most uh, people here know, the formation of <clears throat> 10 of the 8, 10 of the 9 solar mass black holes is not an easy problem. And we won't take the time to try to describe that more, but if you can do what, uh, what something like this could do when you're looking at the whole sky all the time, you will find these. This was recognized back in the 90s as being a way to really uh, constrain supermassive black hole physics, but it's never been done yet. Again, because you need the wide field, high sensitivity. Okay, there are other missions. Our, our proposal for HC, as we call it, that was on the first slide, RECSI, which is an acronym describing our imaging detector uh, system, uh, Energetic Extremes Explorer, because everything we're doing are extreme physics. So that's what HC stands for. You can see what its parameters are compared with everything else up there, Swift Bat and all the other missions that most of you probably recognize. Maybe the one in the last column is not so well known. Uh, SWAM, I think, is supposedly going to be launched in 2022, but 2022 is now one quarter over. And I've heard nothing about it. But anyway, it'll, it'll go. It's an interesting mission. And there's this Japanese mission here that Brandon could tell us about. but. Uh, so there are a bunch of things in, in, uh, in preparation. None of them have the characteristics of what you see in the first column. Okay, so uh, a, another thing that we want to do with this mission, particularly for our number one science goal, something that only gamma ray bursts can uniquely measure, namely, when did the first top three stars form? individual stars, not galaxies. And just to make sure everybody is comfortable with this, um, JWST will never discover a first single top three star, which has not yet you know, been formed in a galaxy. Uh, that top three star is very short lived, a few million years, mass of 30, 40, up to 100 solar masses just like that, they're, you know, they're, they form and they're gone with a huge gamma ray burst, but you don't see that in any wavelength uh, unless you're looking full sky, as we've said. 
So the, uh, the only way to get the first redshifts, the beginning of top three star formation is with gamma ray bursts. I don't think there's any other way you can do it. So that's, that's something that JWST cannot begin to do. The exciting recent result on very high, the highest redshift galaxy is of course further incentive for doing this because the very first pop three stars by definition have to precede the first galaxies. Okay, so um, it, it's you know going to be a, a, a very interesting topic to to develop, and I think GRBs are the only way it can be done. So what we what we want to be able to do or try to do is something that has been talked about for the last twenty years. Use properties of the bursts themselves. We're still in long gamma ray bursts. It turns out this also works for short gamma ray bursts. There isn't time to discuss it right now. But um, beginning with Lorenzo Amati, the Amati relation, uh, <clears throat> two fundamental things that you can measure as observable quantities, namely the fluence of the burst and the peak energy of the burst, E peak, the, the observed E peak, that's what you're looking at on the right there. Those two are highly correlated in intrinsic burst properties, not what you observe. So if you know what the, uh, the flux that you've measured, you can think of it this way. You can, you can ask what must the distance be to produce a <clears throat> E peak and E iso that we measure E iso being the, the total fluence of the burst, the flux integrated over the duration of the burst, obviously, to fall on that relation that gives you a redshift. So from two observable burst parameters, you can get some, what we call, and others have called uh, pseudo redshift. It won't be a very good number, but it will be at least an estimate. And that's important because, and here's the Amati relation, which shows you know, a beautiful correlation. And again, once again, the, these are intrinsic properties of the burst, E peak comma I intrinsic and EISO here, the isotropic energy release by definition is an intrinsic property, of course. So <clears throat> this, this relation, I, I, I don't have the time to show you, has been updated by lots of different people, and including a recent paper, relatively recent in the last year, by Meneev and, I never pronounced the names right, Igor can help me, Poznachenko. Pozniakko, yes, thank you. Um, uh, a very interesting paper on an, an even better way, fundamentally these same parameters, but with additional parameters. I, I will, I can tell anybody or point you to the reference, but um, it is even better than than what this relation suggests. So uh, this really looks doable, but there's a real key instrument requirement that's laid down by this to measure the full flux E iso as an observed quantity and try to then uh, assign it to an intrinsic quantity, you have to be uh, able to measure the burst over a very broad energy range. Our telescope from our, or our detectors rather, which there isn't time to tell you about in detail, but you'll see a few slides, are <clears throat> optimized for spatial and spectral resolution. Uh, they, they are CAD zinc telluride detectors. It's just like what's on new stuff, but now a big array, 256 instead of four in a telescope on new stuff. Um, <clears throat> so the difference, uh, what that kind of imaging detector then does not allow is a very broad energy range. The, the detector is become, becomes totally transparent that energy is significantly above three, four, 500 keV. Our, our energy band where we can do very good imaging where we haven't yet just you know, become transparent is certainly up to 300 keV. You don't need to image at 300 keV. There's no source that we're talking about that if you can see it at 300 keV isn't even brighter at 100 keV. The power law spectra are always declining. So we don't need to image at such high energies, but to measure a pseudo redshift, we need to measure a flux. And that is the argument that I'll 
come to in just a few slides here, to have an additional non-imaging detector, crude detector, back to the early days of Camry Burst. They were discovered with scintillators. And I'll show you a slide in a few minutes here of how we can modify our original design in a very simple way to be able to measure bursts up to 10 MeV energies. So you totally nail EISO, and so you have a much better stab at getting a redshift and getting an object whose position you know, but now whose redshift you can put lower limits on. There's a very nice paper by it's Maniev as the first author. I don't know if you know him, uh, Igor. But anyway, Maniev and Poznanenko uh, have, have a nice paper on doing this and doing exactly what we want to do, showing the redshift must be greater than, okay? And the reason why that's so important is, and again, there's not a slide in this, so I'll just mention this, is that GRBs um, have been, as I've said a couple of times, recognized as the way to really do interesting work on the early universe. The problem has been for the over 20, well, it's now actually exactly 25 years since bursts were discovered to be extragalactic. That was in 1997. Um, <clears throat> so immediately, all sorts of papers appeared. Uh, my God, gamma ray bursts, you can, you can really do something interesting uh, in the early universe. It has not been done because a, very small portions of the sky are looked at and very high redshift bursts are less common than closer by brighter array bursts. So that's a good reason. But the, <clears throat> the problem is that the, uh, the only way to find a high redshift burst to do anything connected with the early universe is it must be done in the infrared. It must be done from the ground because up until Spitzer, there were no space infrared telescopes. And Spitzer is not a rapid, was not a rapid slew telescope. So there's been a complete shutdown in trying to achieve this objective. That's one of the arguments for what I'm going to tell you about at the end. And I better speed up or we'll never get to it. For the, for the time domain spectroscopic observatory, an infrared telescope in space out at L2 that can rapidly point. But you, uh, until we have that, which I hope would be possible for the 2030s as a probe class mission, that is a big mission. But this is something that it can not only do <laughs> GRBs and all sorts of transients, there's all sorts of other things that a rapid sleep telescope can do, which I won't have time to talk, talk about. Um, <clears throat> so, the pseudo redshifts then require the broad energy band, and <clears throat> they require uh, an estimate of redshift greater than, ideally, if you can point from pseudo redshifts, that it's likely to be at redshift greater than six, then every large eight meter, 10 meter telescope uh, will be <laughs> eager to point at that position and do it. But if you look at the history over the last, 10, 15 years in the era of having CAC and Magellan and VLT, the, the response rate has gone down, down, down. So that's why this problem has never been tackled with ground-based infrared telescope. For the other simple reason that a GRB afterglow, which is what you're looking for, you're not gonna see the prompt emission by swinging the VLT around two hours later, you may be on the tail end of the decline, but, but the, <clears throat> the problem fundamentally is when you are observing, even with an eight to 10 meter telescope on the ground, you are looking at a very bright sky. All the fluorescence emissions in the ionosphere <clears throat> produces a forest of lines. And if you're looking in imaging, you're looking against a bright background. And so I, I, I can just make the simple statement that if you look at now, you don't see many such telegrams of upper limits in the infrared for gamma ray burst uh, counterparts with good positions from swift back. If you go and take the time and look for you know hundreds of uh, astronomical telegrams or GCN notices, you will never find. Uh, and now that there's so few and far between, you have to. You know, wait a while to, to see anything, you never find an upper limit that is deeper 
in K band than about 21. And if anybody here can contradict that, I'd love to hear it. But with a long integration, that bright, you know, glowing sky just nails you. Okay. If you're in space above that uh, and out at L2 where this TSO would want to be in five minutes, I'm going to mention this now because I probably will get to the last slide. Uh, in five minutes exposure with a 1.5 meter, not an eight meter telescope, a 1.5 meter telescope that is radiatively cooled to not uh, 30, uh, 15 degrees Kelvin or 30 degrees, whatever JWST is now cooled down to, but only 100 Kelvin. So warm compared to JWST, but that's fine because we only care about getting up to 10 microns, not out to 100 microns. In a five minute exposure in K band or J, H, and K, all three of them, because it doesn't vary, and looking against allowing for the zodiacal light, which is the ultimate background limiting glow, anybody want to guess what magnitude you could reach with a 1.5 meter? 25, 25th magnitude in five minutes. So that, that says you can really do the problem, but you've got to know which bursts that are interesting to look at until there is something like a TSO in space, ideally out of L2, so it doesn't have earth in the way, warm earth and all that stuff. You can't, you can't operate a cold telescope easily. You can do it from geosynchronous. We've actually studied that also, but that's not nearly as good as L2. Okay, I'm gonna speed up because we're getting out of time here already. So here's E peak E ISO. We don't need to spend more time in that. And here's what I've just been describing, which I should have advanced the slide so you could read it while I was talking. But there was just this great, great drop off in interest and sensitivities not able to do what you really wanted to do. So if we really want to get long GRBs to understand the epoch of reionization, which, is, which was our fundamental motivation for proposing the EXIST mission for the last decadal survey, there's a lot of work done on that. What we were proposing then for a huge, <laughs> very big mission, which was too expensive, the decadal survey liked it, but it was way out of the band for cost. And that, so that was not the way to go. But I think now with everything I've been talking about, small sats, much lower cost, much easier to do, detectors that are uh, much more advanced than what we were able to talk about then, that this can be done, but you still need this infrared follow-up if you really want to do pop three stars or use bursts to understand the whole history of massive star formation for a more general objective uh, with going back to the first most massive stars, the top three ones. Okay, um, I'm not gonna take the time that uh, would be required to go through these slides on short gamma ray bursts, but they're very important for understanding neutron star mergers. They, the, the very first one, 1708-17, which is uh, <clears throat> what we're looking at here, showed something new, a short gamma ray burst with soft emission short gamma ray bursts were the ones that were the hard spectra. There was no soft stuff. Well, this was measured, the, the, the light curve you're looking at over there is from Fermi, of course, GBM. And there is modest sensitivity down to 10 keV, but it's really dropping fast. There's nothing below that. So to really nail the merger questions for uh, neutron stars, at least, uh, either with black holes or, or a neutron star, a neutron star merger, you need a, a detector and a telescope that goes down to low energies. So that was where we started with a lot of our work because SwiftMAT does not do that. It goes down to 15 kV. So we've designed a system that I'm not going to have time to show you in detail that goes down to 3 kV. Other bursts have been seen. Here's 1708 again. There's another one over here on the left, 1501, whatever, uh, that is very similar with a soft emission tail. That's a very interesting signature of the fact that these are due to mergers and not due to magnetar outbursts, which is another, uh, it's still valid, still viable uh, explanation for short gamma ray bursts. 
and that produces very hard emission. So anyway, let's quickly move move on here. Uh, the kilonova is, of course, the afterglow or what's produced by the merger, and uh, finding those is in itself a very of great interest. Not since we've only seen one. Uh, what do we really know? We know a lot. Ito and others here have done a lot of nice work on this. Uh, and indeed, the whole uh, <clears throat> process of formation of the uh, our process elements is now much better understood by having just this one verse. Wouldn't it be nice to have hundreds of them? Well, that's, that's one of the goals here. So I'm going to just go through this and show you now a few slides about what this uh, small explorer SMECs that we're working on could do. And <clears throat> what we would be doing with it, and it isn't really described in this slide, is it would be staring at uh, with two telescopes only and looking at not the same source of the sky or region of the sky, although that could be done for very interesting regions like the galactic center. But uh, for a given pointing, uh, the GRBs are totally isotropic, as you all know. So it doesn't matter where you're pointing. But there are interesting places to point, since every region is as good as any other. And those are the test continuous viewing zones, CBZs. Because if your burst goes off when you're staring at the CBZ, which you can do every orbit, it's the ecliptic pole, Earth never gets in your way. Um, then you've got automatically, uh, you know, provided for you optical coverage. So that's an interesting place to look for for uh, for, for GRBs, whatever, short or long, or any other types of transients, TDEs, tidal disruption events. That I'm not going to have time to talk about uh, magnetar outbursts <clears throat> from FRBs. Anything, having the optical coverage for free, if you want to think of it that way, is, is great. And there, there will be other such things in the future. But for now, and probably for the next 10 years, TESS is, is a great place to just, uh, during the orbit, only for with a given telescope for 20 minutes, every 95 minutes, you can stare at the CBZ. OK, um, and I'm not going to take the time to describe that more. And uh, instead, now we'll show you, these are just arguments that I've already talked to you about, that <clears throat> what the history has provided. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm not going to spend time on this, which is much too crowded, and we don't really have this in final form yet. This is the, the, uh, <clears throat> the, um, the SMT, this, or the STM, excuse me, the Science Traceability Matrix, which is a key part of any proposal. We don't have to stare at this for now. But I will give you here on this slide what the basic parameters of the instrument, the telescope, look like. The angular resolution, I've already mentioned, six arc minutes, and a 10 sigma detection, which every GRB is for 30, 40, 50. They're very, very bright. They don't have to be, particularly if they're from uh, at high redshift. But anyway, the the uh, centroiding of a uh, of the angular resolution allows 10 sigma detections, as you can see, to be uh, position accuracies that are 40 arc seconds, 47 arc seconds. So much better than what SWIFT can do. And I won't take the time to talk about the other details here. I don't think we need to see that because of the time. But here's the new detail <clears throat> that I've mentioned. These blue things around the four side, the, the mask, the coated mask, which is a meter by a meter, as you can see, or even a little bigger, 103 centimeters. Those blue things are uh, cesium iodide scintillators. And they will fit. Uh, Brandon hasn't seen this yet, but Anne uh, Violet uh, took an initial look, thought they wouldn't fit, but they will fit in the, uh, in the allowed envelope. And they're very simple, low cost. This is, this is ancient technology. There's nothing new here, except what you can do now is much easier to do it with a simulator because uh, you don't have to use a photomultiplier tube. You use a silicon photomultiplier tube, which is all low voltage and life is much easier. 
What this will allow doing is measuring, as I've mentioned 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, E-peak and E-iso much better. Because when you are out of the range of what the C Cat's Egg Telluride imaging detectors can do reliably, which is above 300 kV, you're, you're not measuring what you want to measure for these pseudo redshifts. That's the primary motivation. But it has another good feature, which I only realized literally in the last week or so. And that is if you tilt these things down, as you can see, or hope you can see the way they're depicted here, <clears throat> from the flat plane, the telescope is obviously pointing this way. But on the four sides, if they're flat down, you expand your field of view. And any gamma ray burst that's coming from way over there, or way over here, or down there, or somewhere over there, will light up the corresponding scintillator. It won't produce a position, but the ratio of counts between the one on the left and the one on the right will give you a very good estimate in, measured in degrees, not even less than that, probably five, even 10 degrees. But um, you will get an instantaneous measurement of where that burst was, which was out of your imaging field of view, okay? The telescope can slew in a matter of minutes. The position is easily computed on board, much much faster than doing the, the, the full imaging position, which is also relatively rapid. And so the field of view is expanded and you can repoint your telescope. So that's a big advantage in trying to increase the burst sample. Here's the field of view that isn't, uh, there isn't time to go through this. All these lines show you the full width half max, the full width, full, uh, you know, full, full width, full max, which is a region where in the center of the detector, you are not degraded by being occulted. You're forming a detecting flux over the whole uh, detector, not partially cut off because it's out of the, <clears throat> uh, out of the collimation induced by, these, by the side shields that you're looking at. These are all the numbers, not any way that you can probably read them from the back row, but they are, they're big. And the short answer, which we have known all along is that the full width that max field of view of this telescope is 65 by 65 degrees, which is one steradial. That's why 12 of them is full sky, right? But with those, with those blue uh, scintillators up here, if I can find my mouse, here we go. This, this thing here and the same on the other side, relatively small, eight centimeters by 70 centimeters, piece of cesium, cesium iodide, like, like so, um, you can expand the field of view. And, uh, and it's a trigger of, uh, field of view. That's the reason for the title here, which increases the field of view. And in fact, that obviously just increases your rate of discovery. So I won't spend more time on it, but it's it not only then is allowing the pseudo redshifts, it's giving you more of them. Okay, a uh, few slides on sensitivities and alignment. Um, and here we are comparing what HC would do versus Swift Bat. It's comparable. So the main differences are angular resolution and energy energy band. So those are the those are the key key arguments that we have made from the beginning that we want to go to lower energies and higher energies, and now even still higher energies, because this pseudo redshift business is 20 years ago, people were, uh, there was a big argument, I remember being part of this, and whether people believed the Amati relation, it was not taken seriously. It has stood the test of time, and it's now been improved on by the paper that sorry, I mentioned a few minutes ago. So there really is good reason to ex extend the energy band to make those measurements and get redshifts until we have some way of doing it in space, which we don't have and which JW won't provide, nor will um, the Roman telescope, what we used to call W first, that will also not rapidly slew. So those are all arguments that point to the need for, uh, <clears throat> for extremely large telescopes on the ground, which can probably obviously will go fainter than K, JHK band uh, magnitudes of 21 or 22. They will, they will probably get down to 24 when you have a 
huge aperture telescope like the GMT, uh, but it, it can be done much more easily and efficiently and accurately from a small telescope that's cold, which has to be in space. Uh, I won't take the time to walk you through this diagram, which is a bit out of date because some of the things I've told you about have not been incorporated in this. <clears throat> but uh, this single small explorer is, <clears throat> is very competitive compared with other missions, in particular, E. Rosita Art XC, which is the focusing hard X ray telescope. Very beautiful telescope. That's the sort of uh, gold color here, as you can see. But the, the farther out from the center that you are is the better in this kind of diagram, uh, which is a so-called star diagram. And HC, this little you know cubic meter is you know bigger than most of these things. Not not always. And and some of these numbers are out of date. So the field of view, for example, is now even bigger than what what it was when we made this figure. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go on from here and show you very quickly for those who are interested in what the instrument is. The coated mask is tungsten. It's something we know how to do. Brandon here designed this. This is the coated mask that we flew on our Proto Exist 2 mission back in 2012, high altitude balloon flight. Those are roughly millimeter sized holes. Brandon, correct me, 1.3, is that what it was? Uh, it was 1.4. So 1.4, okay. So you can do this with etching and you can make high resolution masks. The smaller the pixel, the smaller its angular diameter, the higher your imaging resolution at 100 keV is. And tungsten is a very high Z element, so it's a beautiful absorber. And the only flux that gets to the CAD zinc telluride is going through an open hole. So these are the side shields, that great big bucket. You know, you've got to make, uh, keep all the cosmic X-ray background which out, all the AGN integrated over the universe. Uh, and that's done just as it was or is on BAT and on Fermi with a graded shield, multi-elements, because you don't want to be blinded by fluorescence lines. All that stuff has been done. Here's the CCT detector array. What you see on the left over there is what we flew on that balloon flight in 2012. So we've done things like this, but now with a far better readout system that's been developed than what we had way back when, 10 years ago now, good heavens. And the thing on the top there is what we flew, large gaps. Those gaps will disappear if we went to through silicon views. The gaps are there because to read out the ASICs, the detectors on MuSTAR, it was done through wire bonds. And I'm not gonna show you a picture of them, but they're underneath right here. These are the wire bonds underneath these protective shields. Those introduce the gaps. And gaps are not good when you're trying to do <clears throat> wide field imaging because the cosmic X-ray background blasts you on the sides of the detectors. So you want them packed together nice and tightly, which is what we can do. And energy resolution and getting down to low energies. There's the iron line over there uh, in green, which we weren't able to do 10 years ago, but now we've done and we're pushing it down below, below the five point uh, 9 keV that you're seeing there down to probably 2.5 or 3. Okay, so and here's what the imaging looks like uh, at high resolution. Don't worry about that thing there. That's the bias lead uh, to get high voltage. High voltage meaning minus 400 volts. Uh, not very high voltage, but relatively high. So I won't take the time to go through these technical details, probably of less interest to most here, but a lot of this has been done and we are really getting close to the point and I think by next year when this proposal comes out, we will have a real working system that could be proposed for a flight mission. Okay, um, so I don't think we need to talk about what's on this slide, and, but there are lots of things, well, some of these things I've already mentioned about how we choose our targets. and the fact that we are able to downlink at relatively easily uh, provided rapid downlinks to get burst positions down to the ground. So that, and here's the way we can do it through something that a few years ago didn't exist. But we've 
what we were thinking about five years ago was going through the NASA data system, which is much more complex, much more expensive. Here's a commercial device that basically can you can download your quick positions and uh, you know, rough summaries of fluxes as SwiftBat does very, very easily. So, and I think this is really showing you more than you probably are interested in seeing, but how this thing would actually operate. <clears throat> Looking at interesting regions on the sky where you've, you've got to point somewhere and you want to be pointing at different positions with the two different satellites. And ultimately, of course, with the MIDEX, with 12 of them, it doesn't matter where you're pointing because you're covering the whole sky. And there are lots of interesting things that will be lots of interesting, uh, not just time domain, but, but longer term observations. One thing that I may have mentioned in the abstract, I think I did, from the full sky MIDEX version that could be operating in 2029 20, or 30, or proposed then, so it wouldn't be operating then. Um, the full sky hard X-ray uh, uh, survey that would be done continuously, because you're looking at the whole sky all the time, becomes significantly more sensitive than anything that has been done up until now, or up until then. Okay, so the MIDEX mission, is is what I've talked about, and there's just the schematic kind of picture of it, what it might look like. Not that that's of particular interest, but just showing that uh, you would point these things so that the fields overlap, but so that they're covering everything. You're pointing up at the poles, you're pointing at every position. And it actually presents an interesting question, which has never been dealt with that I know of, of how an individual one of these satellites, they're all in low Earth orbit, 500 kilometers. They have to slew to get to their next assigned position. And I'm, we're going to have an undergrad working on that this summer to think about how one can design a pointing algorithm that would do this. It certainly can be done, but it's never that I know of been thought of because nobody's ever thought of a telescope like this that is covering everything all the time. If you were sitting out at L2, it would be trivial. You just assign position and there you are. But this is much less expensive than being out at L2 and is doable. And, uh, and, and the short answer, just to make you believe that this is doable, is that the fields of view of each one are large enough that they don't have to overlap exactly. They will, uh, you know, allowing for the time to slew from target one to the next next pointing position. So it will work, but it'll be an interesting question of how it works. Okay, just to finish up here, here's the TSO, Time Domain Spectroscopic Observatory in schematic form. And I should have shown you this slide first. It shows a, a cartoon version of it and how it would, uh, how it would appear roughly to scale 1.5 meter telescope out at L2, as you can see here, with a relatively small field of view for imaging, five by six arc minutes, um, <clears throat> which is much bigger than you need for <clears throat> locating something that you have a 30, 40 arc second position of. But the image immediately pops up, and because the positions from the the four Pixio, the mid-X version, would be even better. As I said, it would be more like 20 arc second positions. You could almost drop your object or your your slewed from the TSO telescope, which can rapidly slew, which no other telescope in space can do. You could put it on the slit. A little bit dangerous. You want an image first and then do the fine uh, adjust to get on the slit, but with uh, two uh, spectral ranges, low resolution for very faint targets, resolution of 100 to 200 versus 2000. So you can get very good redshifts very rapidly. Nothing would be missed. And with uh, a 1.5 meter, you are, it'll be interesting to compare <clears throat> with <laughs> afterglows when they are first seen by anything at redshifts greater than nine, the highest redshift GRB that has been measured in the history of GRB science is at redshift nine. 
there's a controversial one at 10, which wasn't, uh, the redshift is not that certain, but nine or 10. And those were roughly 21st magnitude. This telescope, as I've already told you, and I think I didn't put it uh, well, yeah, right here, here it is again, the AV magnitude of 25 and 300 seconds will eliminate the problem of, are we going to paint it up? Uh, unless for other reasons, uh, if we're working in the infrared, so we don't have to worry about dust uh, attenuation, but it may be that at still earlier times, it's not obvious why this would be the case because Redshift 9 is already at, uh, uh, at early times, but not yet back to where the first pop three stars are gonna be. But the luminosity uh, is, is going to make it easily detectable. And so I don't think that this issue of getting the precise <clears throat> uh, infrared image and then spectrum is at all a worry, but I'm just showing you exactly what, what you're up against here. And that's everything, which I think I've gone over on time. So let me stop and ask if there are questions on any of this. Okay. Well, let's start with question from the room first. Yes. Yeah. Igor. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to tell you that you can do magnitude 25 and K AD from the ground now. Yeah. With Gemini adaptive optics. Uh -huh. Gemini South adaptive optics imager that's called that you can get Gemini South adaptive optics imager. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in one hour, you can get to the very mag of 23. Which okay. is oh. 25. Yeah. But you know, you first need like uh, three guide stars yeah. in the field to, to direct concentration of the stuff yeah. of magnitude 18 or brighter. And then you also need uh, 30 minutes of overhead to set up the AO system. So basically, they don't yeah. operate in the TO mode and they right. don't even operate in the FT fast turnaround mode. So you yeah. need to ask for time well in advance. Yeah. And then they will they work in campaigns, but in principle it's possible. Okay, that's for GRBs, interesting. Or GRBs, in principle. Yeah, it would be tough for GRBs, and much much simpler for something like this. Yeah, yes. Uh, well, you, you know. okay. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah uh, continuing in that vein. Yeah. Uh, four star on Bada. Yeah, I uh, can do 23rd magnitude in an hour mm -hmm. uh, in, in J and K. It's a kind of a scheduling program problem. Yeah, uh, but you know, I, I, for example, have very, very big programs for doing galaxy clusters, which never change mm -hmm. in uh, J and K. And so, you know, if you called me up and said, "Hey, go look at this," um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we could do 23rd magnitude in an hour. Okay, as I said earlier, <clears throat> in the era when people were doing, you know, much more complete follow-ups or attempts, the magnitudes literally are never fainter than about 21, maybe 22 in a few cases, but with long exposures. Uh, these were done from, from VLT in some cases. The, the record holder redshift 9, 9.4, whatever it is, <clears throat> was a... 21 or 22 with the VLT. Well, well, four star is a wonderful instrument and it's yeah. underutilized. Um, okay. And, and yeah. we, we were at the SBT consortium, we're doing our infrared with Spitzer uh, for years. And yeah. uh, when Spitzer died, we switched over to four star and we're happy with it. We're uh, the software for data reduction is awful, but yeah. the instrument itself is great. Is the instrument always available? Yes. Yes. Okay. It's a facility. Yeah. Okay. It's a facility right. instrument. And Good. It only depends on the scene quality. So if it's 0.3, yep. uh, then you get to magnitude 23. If it's one arc second, then you won't. Yep. So it's a yep. Well, much easier this way. If this, well, much easier, but much more expensive. But much more, yes. 
But there are a lot of other things this could do, which I yeah, sure. I could start talking about, but I think you probably don't want to hear about all the other things. There, there, there are other things that would make it very justifiable to have, but anyway. Maybe last question yeah. from the audience here. Do you have a question? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of overhead associated with kind of pointing on these a lot of existing space missions. Sure. So how are you guys accomplishing the rapid slew? On the small set? Yeah. Is it just that it's you all, don't have to, like, it, your field of view It can all be done auto autonomously. From the and burst. How is it stable? How does it not result in, like, vibrations or things that will mess up your image? No, it doesn't. It, it okay. can do a rapid slew, and then it's an inertially pointed system. So the, the pointing precision uh, is at the arc second level. So totally, totally uh, sufficient for something for which you've gotten a one arc minute or 30 arc second position. So that's just not an issue at all. This is, this is the Blue Canyon uh, technology, BCT. Um, have really a, a beautiful spacecraft, which is, it's almost like, it, you know, we were just blown away by this. It was exactly the footprint of, that I showed you on the slide of, of our detector system. And it points and is stable pointing at the five arc second level and aspect from star tracker cameras at, again, the three or four arc second level. So plenty good. And it, so it isn't, it's just not an issue. That's the easy part. And there are other parts that aren't quite so easy. But the position we compute on board in the image plane get, and a rough position to, if we have to slew the telescope because it's one of these triggered events in these side detectors, that can be done, again, very rapidly, just ratios of counts. So if I go so far this way and I go so far that way, uh, easily done. Can I actually add a little yeah. quick into that? So yeah. I think that we're about seven uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think selling time is an issue, but it's. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, we have to work out some of the detail. Yeah. Time. We can correct the energy in space for uh, moving the back of the spacecraft. Right? So the dry is a projector. Yeah. And then we can think about the supplemental sensors that we can mount on the uh, one of the detector points to take care of those sorts of things as well. So I don't think, like John is saying, in the end, it's not a very big um, it shouldn't be a very big deal. Yeah, it won't be. That's, that's a good question, but it, it, it's, the technology is amazing what these guys have developed. <clears throat> and the cost is amazing, too. For a spacecraft with that performance characteristics, $5 million. From, from a you know previous generation, that would be at least 50 or probably closer to 100 so it's just a totally different world, and that's, that's why the small set business is a very exciting, you know, new opportunity to do new new physics. Okay, okay. thanks, Amy. Do you see any question from the Zoom? Let's try to take one if there is one. Um, there's nothing in the chat, and I don't see any hands raised. Okay, so maybe let's okay. conclude here, and let's thank our speaker again. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. With minimal damage, let's try to switch off there. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Larry Nightclub. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Good. 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 Good.